Alrighties, hi everyone, welcome to your pre-lesson video on rational expressions and equations. So we got a lot of things covered today, so let's get started. So first thing we're going to go over is simplifying rational expressions. So essentially a rational expression is just polynomials, but in fractions, right? As you can see, we have a numerator and a denominator. So when we want to simplify rational expressions, the first thing we want to do is factor out our greatest common factor first and see what we can cancel out of each other. So if we look at 10x cubed, there is nothing to factor out. So we'll just write it as it is. But then now let's look at the bottom of 2x squared minus 18x. If we noticed, 2x would be our greatest common factor there. So we'll factor it out from 2x squared minus 18 to give us 2x times x minus 19. All right, and now from here, if we look, since the top doesn't have the factor x minus 9, it wouldn't get simplified. But our 10x cubed can be simplified with 2x. So if we look at the coefficients, 10 and 2, they both can be divided with 2, right? So. Uh, 10 divided by 2 is 5, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. And then if we look at that, we also have x cubed in the numerator and x at the bottom, right? So from there, we know it's going to be x to the power of 3 minus 1 divided by, and then since this factor of x minus 9 um, isn't factored out, we're just going to write it at the bottom like this. From here, let's solve the 5x, 3 minus 1 will become 2. All right. So once we simplify everything, we should get 5x squared divided by x minus 9. And that will be how you simplify a rational expression, All right? Now, if we look at the bottom question, we have 3x cubed minus 15x squared plus 12x. Let's first see what we can do, right? If you noticed, um, on the, in the numerator, their greatest common factor is going to be 3x. So let's factor that out. And once we factor that out, we are going to get x squared minus 5x plus 4 divided by, and also if we notice uh, for the denominator here, we have 3x minus 3, which means that their greatest common factor is going to be 3. So let's factor that out to give us 3 times x minus 1, right? Now from here, before we even factor anything out, because we have a quadratic here, let's see how we can factor that. So remember, with the butterfly method that we learned in the previous lessons, let's use that to find its factors, right? So remember, values of a, c, and b are written there, and then it's a trial and error method. So let's see, I'm going to use negative 4 and negative 1, because negative 4 times negative 1 becomes 4, right? Cross-multiply. We get negative 4, negative 1, these two add to give us negative 5. So that's right. So that means our factors are going to be x minus 4 and x minus 1, right? So let's write that on top here. Same thing at the bottom since we didn't do anything to it. Now, as you can see, oh, we have factors on top, right? We have x minus 1 on top right here and we have x minus 1 at the bottom here. So that means these two can cancel out. And then let's also look, we have 3x and 3. The 3s will cancel out each other, boom, boom. And so that gives us x times x minus 4 on top divided by essentially 1, which you can just write it as x times x minus 4. And that will be the answer. Right? Or if you could also distribute it again to give you x squared minus 4x. And the, these two will be the answer. All right. 
Now, with multiplying and dividing rational expressions, they are pretty much the same, like how you would simplify and multiply and divide them, like any other fractions that we did before, right? So let's look. We have 12x squared divided by, I mean, 12x squared over 5y cubed times 20y to the power of 4 over 6x cubed. So remember, when we are multiplying, we are looking across to see um, if they can be simplified or not. So if I were to rearrange this, right, it would also look like 12x squared over 6x cubed times 20y to the power of 4 over 5y cubed. All right, from here, let's look. 12 and 6, they both can be divided by 6. So we have that. And then if we look, oh, the base is same, right? They're axes. So that means we can subtract them. So we write the bottom here, right? We have 2x, 2 minus 3 times. Now let's look on the right side. 20 and 5 can both be divided by so let's go ahead and do that. And then these two are bases of y, so they can subtract with each other. So if I were to rewrite that, it'll look like this. All right. Now from here, let's uh, figure out the exponents. So we have 2x, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, times 4y, 4 minus 3 is 1. So we don't even need to write the 1. All right. Now from here, let's do we have if we multiply everything we're going to get 2x negative uh, 2x to the power of negative sorry my bad 2 times 4 we're going to get 8x to the power of negative 1y now uh, you actually learn this in your next lesson that with negative exponents um normally i just want you to write it as a with all your exponents being positive right so with negative exponents, essentially, we're just going to flip them upside down. So the x that's on top, because it's negative 1, to make it positive, we're going to flip it upside down and put it at the bottom, as you can see. So this will be the answer. All right, if you have any questions about this, uh, bring it to your deep dive lesson. Now, same thing with this also, even though there is a quadratic here, but let's actually first um, factor that out to see if we can simplify it to make our lives a lot easier. So I'm just going to go ahead and write the others first since we're not going to do anything with them. And then if I look, and if you notice, right, coefficient in front here is 1 and this is 25. They're both perfect squares, which means we can apply the rule for difference of two squares, right? So that is going to give me x minus 5, x plus 5. All right. Now I'm just going to put parentheses around all these others. That way you can maybe see it better. So if we look here, right, let's simplify before we actually multiply. Um, let's see. Up and down here, as you can see, we have x minus 5. So these two will cross out each other. And now we have x plus 5 here and x plus 5 here. So they're across. Right, so that means these ones would also simplify each other. And now let's multiply on top essentially is just one. This is also one. So one times one is one over x minus five times one is gonna give us x minus five. And this will be it. All right, and that's how you simplify rational, uh, multiply rational expressions. Now let's look at this one. Oh, a little bit more complex because there's more polynomials, right? But don't worry. First thing, again, you want to do is to factor them out to see if we can cross out anything. That will make your life so much easier when you are simplifying it and when you're multiplying it because you'll be dealing with a lot less um, terms, right? So if we look at the bottom, x squared plus 3x, take out their common factor, which is x, to give us x plus 3 in the parentheses, times, okay, let's look, 
da, 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 da. I'm trying to factor out this now, as I'm using the butterfly method for that. So I'm going to try 1 and 1, 7 and 3. Yep, that's going to be it. So our my factor for x squared plus 10x plus 21 is going to be x plus 7 times x plus 3. I'm going to write that on top. And then for x squared minus 49, uh, if you notice, again, this is a difference of two squares. And that is going to give me x plus 7, x minus 7. All right. I'm just going to draw a little fairy here. There we go. Now from here, let's uh, cross out anything that we can to simplify the factors and make it easier for us to multiply. So let's look up and down first. So we look x plus 7 on top and bottom. So let's cancel that out. And now we have x plus 3, x plus 3 here. So let's cancel these out also. All right, so hmm, it looks like I can't uh, simplify anything just yet. So let me just write out what I have, All right? So I have 7 minus x times 1 over x times x minus 7. So let me just write that real quick. Now, if you notice, hmm, 7 minus x and x minus 7 looks really familiar. And actually, if you do this one extra step, you can simplify it. So let's look. Let's make this x become positive. And how are we going to do that? We are going to factor out negative 1, right? So we factor negative here. We're going to get negative 7 plus x over x times x minus 7. Now I'm going to rearrange the top a bit to let you see what I got now. Oh, that's supposed to be minus. There we go. And then look, we have factors of x minus 7 on top and bottom, which means we can cross that out. And that will then give us negative 1 over x. And that'll be our answer. All right. Now, when we are dividing rational expressions, again, like normal, Essentially, it's the same step as before. You want to flip the fraction that's on the right upside down. All right, so if you look at what I'm going to do, before I even factor anything, I'm just going to flip it. So I have, so my fraction that's on the left, I'm going to just write it as it is because I'm not going to do any flipping. Now, if you look, my fraction on my right, I'm going to have x squared minus 4 divided by 1. See how these two are flipped upside down, right? That's the first thing you want to do when you come across um, division. You want to flip the thing that's on the right. And then from there, you're going to change the divide sign to a multiply sign. All right, now from here, I am going to factor my polynomials out. So let's see. I'm going to do it at the bottom. I'm going to do for x squared minus 7x plus 10. If I factor it out, let's see. Let's use 5 and 2. It's going to give us 5, 2. Yep, that will work. So our factor for the first one is going to be x plus 5, x plus 2. All right. Then for the bottom, let's go ahead and do that. So it's x squared plus 4x plus 4. Oh, it's obviously 2 and 2. There we go. Yep. So we got x plus 2 squared. The reason I write squares is because these two are repeated twice, right? You could also just write x plus 2 times x plus 2, but if they're repeated, you can just write it as square. All right. Times. Now, if you notice, x squared minus 4, differences of two squares again, right? So this, I know this will give me x plus 2, x minus 2. All that divided by 1. All right, now let's go ahead and simplify things to make our lives easier. So we look. We have, where is my mouse? There we go. We have x plus 
2 squared here, and we have 2x plus 2s on top, so we're going to actually just slowly cross them out. So we cross these ones. So if, we, if I cross this one out with this, I'm just going to cancel out the 2, and now I have x plus 2 here and x plus 2, right? So these ones are going to cross out. And so now that is going to give me x plus 5 here and x minus 2 here. So I'm just going to go ahead and write that. If we multiply them, we get this over 1, right? Now, obviously, when we know over 1, it, we don't technically don't even need to write over 1. So I'm just going to go ahead and ex um, distribute these parentheses. Once I distribute them, it's going to give me x squared plus 5x minus 2x minus 10. Group all the like terms, and that's going to give me x squared plus 3x minus 10. And that will be the expression um, simplified. All right, if you have any questions about this, bring this to your deep dive lesson. Now, the next thing that we have with adding and subtracting rational expression, expressions. Again, like any other fractions, we got to make sure that the denominator um, is the same, right? So first things first, here's my tip for rational expressions when you're adding and subtracting them. If you have a polynomial at the bottom, factor it out first. You'll see why in a second. So let's go ahead and factor that out. So if I factor that out, we have x times x plus 1, right? Now if we look, ooh, both fractions have x. This fraction, though, doesn't have x plus 1 at the bottom. So in order for these two to have the common denominator, what this tells me is that they both have x, so that it's fine, but this fraction is missing x plus 1. So I need to multiply my numerator and denominator with x plus 1. All right, so that this is how it's going to look like. And then since this fraction has the common denominator. We're just going to write it as it is and not do anything. All right. From there, let's multiply the numerator and denominator, and we are going to get x plus 3, the uh, 3x plus 3 on top. And then normally I just say um, the denominator, just leave it as it is. You don't even really need to expand it out. All right, from here, you're going to get this. And then now, because their denominators are the same, we can technically group the top together into one big fraction. So it's going to look like 3x plus 3 plus 1 divided by x times x plus 1. All right. The, now, the only reason I say don't even need to expand the bottom is because sometimes even after we solve the top, there might be a case where you're able to factor it. And if you're able to factor it, go ahead and do that. And then if, you know, they're able to, any of the factors on top and the bottom are able to cancel out each other, you would do that because you're trying to simplify the, um, the fraction. All right. Now, continuing on from here, we're going to group all the like terms to give us 3x plus 4 over x times x plus 1. All right. And then if I look at the top, I know that 3x plus 4 have nothing in common. So this will be my final answer. All right. All righty. Now, for this one, note the subtraction sign that is in front here and the subtraction sign that's here. All right, be very careful. Now, actually, the first thing I want to do here is I'm going to go ahead and factor this to see if, I, if it can cancel out anything for me. That will make my life a lot easier. All right, so let's do at the bottom, at the side here. So 2x minus 1. We'll have 2 and 1 here. Um, let's put negative 1 and 1. Let's see if this works. Um, negative 1, 2. 
Yep. So that means our factor for that is going to be 2x minus 1, x plus 1. All right? And then if we actually look at the bottom. I'm just going to flip this around so that x is in front. We get x plus 1. And then I'm just going to rewrite the fraction that's on the right as it is. We're not going to do anything to it yet. Now, if you look, ooh, x plus 1, x plus 1, which means these two can actually um, cancel out each other, right? They're simplified. So let's go ahead and do that. And now that is going to give me negative 2x minus 1 over 1 minus 5 over 1 minus x. Now, if we look here, again, because it is a fraction, we need to make the denominator the same in order to simplify it, right? So if we look, the denominator, we have 1 and 1 minus x. In order to make them both have the common denominator, I'm going to multiply this fraction with 1 minus x. All right, so it's going to look like this. And obviously, technically, you'll multiply 1 here, but if you multiply 1, you're just going to get back the same thing. So, all right, if we look here, once I multiply it out, I'm going to get negative, because I'm not doing anything to the negative sign that's in front here yet. So I have negative 2x minus 2x squared minus 1 plus x divided by 1 minus x minus 5 over 1 minus x. All right. Now, from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group the like terms that are in the parentheses with, and rearrange it from uh, greatest to least degree. So it's going to give me negative 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. All right, and I write everything else as it is since we didn't do anything to it. Next thing I'm going to do is I am going to open the parentheses and distribute this negative sign as well as bringing, as, I mean, as well as putting this 5 onto one big fraction with this, since now that their denominators are the same. All right. So once I open the parentheses, uh, distribute the negative sign, it's going to give me 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. If I bring the 5 over, note negative, right? So it's negative 5 or minus 5 divided by 1 minus x. From here, I'm going to group my like terms. It's going to give me 2x squared minus 3x minus 4 over 1 minus x. And this will be the final answer, right? Or if, you know, you don't like seeing this x being negative, what you could do is just factor the negative sign out. So um, your top will still be the same, right? It's still going to be 2x squared minus 3x minus 4 divided by, now if I factor out the negative sign, negative sign comes out, x plus 1, oh, x minus 1, there we go. All right, and then that will be your final answer. These two will be it. All right. Now, so what we have covered here is order of operations for rational expressions, obviously, like order of operations, you want to do PEMDAS. So if you ever have like a multiplication or division of the rational expressions inside it, do that first. Um, if you have the parentheses and exponents, do that first, obviously. So remember, PEMDAS, always PEMDAS. Now, um, with rational equations, sometimes the question, they, it's good to know how to form a rational equation because in both the ACT and the SAT, they will ask you for characteristics of the graph um, or the characteristics of the rational equation that they gave you and it's really helpful to know how to identify the parts. 
So with that, we are actually going to go through how to form a rational equation based on a graph, right? And so here that I have in front, a lot of words, yes, but these are the steps, right? So let's go through it first. And we'll actually also do an example to see uh, so that you can see what I mean, right? So first thing you want to do is to find the holes first, if there are any, and determine what their x coordinates are. Now, if you look here, this hollow dot is what we call a hole, right? So it's a just a single point on the graph where no values um, would touch it because it's like a hole, like things fall to a hole. Okay. So first thing you want to do is find the hole, right? Determine the hole in the uh, rational equation. Now holes normally you would be able to cancel it out um, on the top like you simplify it and the top and the bottom of the rational equation they will cancel each other out because they're the same factors. Okay so let's see yeah so once you find a hole you want to write its x coordinates in factored form on the top and bottom of your fraction. So if you look at this one here right I they don't actually have a hole for this one. But if we look at, say, let's jump ahead, look at this one. Later down the line, you'll actually see what I mean by how to find a hole. But this question does have one. All right. So after you find a hole, write its x coordinates in factor form on the new, uh, top and bottom of your fraction. All right. Now, the next thing after finding the holes is the x intercepts of the graph. And then you want to write that in their x coordinates also in factor form on the top of the fraction only. So like, for example, like, see the x plus 2 square times x minus 2. These two would be the x coordinates for the for this rational function. All right. Now, you want to check on the graph itself if it bounces. Right, so if it bounces, it looks like it boinks, like literally boink. This is bounces. Like if it touches like this, this is bounce. And this is cross because it crosses through the point. Now that would determine if you use a polynomial two or a polynomial of one here. All right. Um, if it bounces, you will put it as two like right here, and if it crosses, you'll write it as 1, like here. All right. So that one is just from looking at the graph, or if they explicitly tell you it has a multiplicity of 2 or 1, if it bounces or it crosses, that will determine it, right? And it's really important to note that because it will affect your graph and what you find later um, in a few steps down the line. All right, once you found the x-intercepts and you've written it on the top of your fraction, the next thing you want to find are your vertical asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes are normally denoted as dashed lines going like this. And that means like the line will approach that value but never touches it. All right, so determine what your vertical asymptote is and write it in factor form on the bottom of the fraction. All right, so that means you're going to write it at the bottom like this. Once you write the vertical asymptotes at the bottom of your fraction, the next thing you want to determine on the graph if it has a horizontal asymptote, an oblique asymptote, or none, using the certain uh, criteria below to make sure the degree of the equation is correct. So uh, what I mean by that is if you see on the graph it has a horizontal asymptote or an oblique asymptote, right? or maybe it has none, what you would need to do is determine, um, you're just going to use that line. Normally it does tell you on the graph itself um, if it has an horizontal asymptote or an oblique asymptote. And this is to just help you make sure that your exponents in the graph are correct. So we're actually going to see that in the practice um, question that we have in a second. All right, so some of the criteria for asymptotes uh, horizontal and oblique asymptotes are here. So for A, if the highest degree on the top of the fraction is less by 1, then the highest 
slow, uh, higher degree on the bottom of the fraction, then your horizontal asymptote will be y equals 0. So for this case, it's like, say, you have x squared over x cubed, right? Because the degree here is smaller on top, is smaller than the bottom by 1, your horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 0. Now, if the highest degree on the top of the fraction is the same with the highest degree on the bottom of the fraction, then your horizontal asymptote will be the coefficient of the highest degree on top divided by the coefficient of the highest degree at the bottom. So we're going to use this function as an example. All right. So um, power So the power function is the term with the biggest pollen, uh, biggest degree in your function. So if I can tell, this is going to be because x squared. So here's a trick to find a power function. Um, look at your axis, right? If you have a square, do x squared. This is x1. So x squared times x1 is going to be x cubed. So my power function for my numerator is going to be x cubed. And what this tells me that it has a degree of 3 and a coefficient of 1, right? Because there's the number 1 in front here, which you technically don't write. All right, we found that out. Now we need to find the power function of the bottom of the fraction. So let's look. Um, again, x squared x1, so that gives me x cubed, but then there's also 2 here, so x cubed times 2 is going to give me 2x cubed. So this tells me that my power function is going to be 2x cubed, all right? And from there, that tells me it has a degree of 3 and a coefficient of 2, right? Now, based on this, I know I will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1, half. First thing, because 1, the degrees are the same. Right? And because the degrees are the same, I'm going to take the coefficient on my top, which is 1, and divide it with the coefficient of the bottom, which is 2, which will give me 1 half. All right? That's why my horizontal asymptote is y equals half. And that will be the case for this um, horizontal asymptote. Now, the other one is if the highest degree on the bottom of the fraction is more uh, on the top of the fraction is more by 1 than the highest degree on the bottom of the fraction, then you will not have a horizontal asymptote, but an oblique asymptote. So essentially for this case, um, let's say our top is x cubed and our bottom is x squared. See how the degree on top is bigger than the bottom by 1? That means you will have an oblique asymptote. All right. And now the um, oblique asymptotes will be drawn like as a dash, straight dash line going diagonally. So dot, 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 like this, or dot, 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 like that. Horizontal asymptotes are horizontal, all right? Now, in order to find the oblique asymptote, because the question might ask you in the test, right? Um, you're going to have to use polynomial long division to find out what the equation of the oblique asymptote is. All right. Now for, let's take a look at your functions and you find out that either the, maybe the top degree is bigger than the bottom degree by two or the um, top degree is less than the bottom degree by five, right? No, those cases, right? The difference is more than one. When the difference of your degrees of the top and bottom are more than one, then you will not have a horizontal or oblique asymptote. All right. The only time you will have a horizontal, so to recap, uh, you will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero if your top degree is smaller than your bottom degree by one. If your degrees are the same for both the top and the bottom, then your horizontal asymptote would be the coefficients of the top dividing the bottom. And then your third scenario, your third case would be if the degree on top is bigger than the degree of the bottom by one, you will not have a horizontal asymptote, but an oblique asymptote. You would use polynomial long division to find the equation of the oblique asymptote if they want you to find it. 
All right. If you have any questions about this, I know that was a lot. Bring it to your deep dive lesson. All right. Now, after that, we once we determine the horizontal and oblique asymptote, if there's any to help make sure you know the degrees of the equations are correct, we're going to find what I call the constant, and I denote it as v at the very beginning of the graph. We'll see in a second. By first determining the coordinates of the y-intercept and plugging in the values accordingly to the equation that you just got to solve for v, right? Because that's going to be the constant. So you actually see this in this current question here. It's actually a special case, as well as in your deep dive lesson, how we're going to find v, all right? So once we find b, then you're technically done. Now, depending on the instructions um, on the test, you know, they ask you to form the rational equation. You should be fine just leaving it in factored form. But unless the answer option gives you with everything in expanded form, then obviously go ahead and expand it. All right. Now let's look at this practice question. First thing I'm going to write is fx. I technically can also write as y, but that's fine. All right, first thing I'm going to determine is my horizontal, sorry, my um, hole. So if I look, my hole has a coordinate of 0 for its x. So that means I'm just going to write x here. All right, and then I'm going to write b here because it's at the beginning of the function and I, it's a constant that I know. So whole, I'm going to write it as x right over here. Now, the next thing I'm going to determine is my x-intercept. So if x, this is really, really hard to see. But actually, your x-intercept would be right here, right? So that tells me that my x-intercept will have a coordinate of 1, 0. And now because I want to write the x-coordinate in factor form, I'm going to write it as x equals 1. I want this one to be on the same side as x, so I'm going to reverse it. Subtract 1, subtract 1, so I'm going to get x minus 1 equals 0. So that means in factor form, it's going to be x minus 1, and that's what I'm going to write here. All right, and because if I look, oh, it's cross. Right, which means I have a multiplicity of one, which is why my degree here is going to be one. So I don't need to write anything there. All right. Oop, I forgot. Whole. So I also need to write x down there. Okay. All right. On to the next thing. Now we need to find the horizontal ascent. Uh, the vertical asymptotes. My bad. So the vertical asymptotes, as you can see, would be these two dashed lines. From here, I know my vertical asymptote is x is negative 3 and x is 3. Again, I want these in factored form. All right, so these will give me x plus 3 and x minus 3 for factored forms. And I'm going to write that at the bottom of my um, fraction. All right, now let's look. Oh, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. But if I look here, right, my total degree here is only going to be 2, and my total degree here is going to be 3, which means that I should have a horizontal asymptote of y, uh, y equals 0 in this case. But because this is a graph, it's fixed, right? That means... I need to fix the top in order for this, because I definitely know this is correct. Um, I need to fix the top in order for it to have the same degree as the bottom, right? Because we have y equals 2 for the horizontal asymptote. Now, I know for a fact that the x-intercept crosses because it's very clear. And technically, if you look at the hole, it balances a tiny bit. So I'm going to put my power 2 right there. All right. Now, the next thing we need to do is find B. But here's the thing. If you notice, the hole is also our, technically, 
at the location of where our y-intercept is. So we wouldn't be able to do the normal step that we would to find b, because we're just going to get 0 divided by 0 if we plug in the coordinates, right? Now, because I know for a fact that our v here in this case would relate actually to our horizontal asymptote, right? This tells me that my b would equal to whatever my horizontal asymptote is, which in this case, it tells me that b equals 2 because y equals 2, right? Now from here, because I know what my b is, I can finally write out my function as fx equals 2x squared times x minus 1 divided by x times x plus 3 times x minus 3. All right, so you can write your answer, your rational equation like this, or maybe, you know, the answer option that gives you as expanded. So if you want to expand it, then just, you know, go ahead and expand it. So in expanded form, this rational equation will look like 2x cubed minus 2x squared divided by x cube minus 9x. Yeah, I already went ahead and simplified everything for you. But yes, these two will be the rational equation for this graph. All right. Now, just a little thing for you. Luckily, you know, on both in the ACT and SAT test, like I was telling you earlier, you don't actually need to graph the actual rational function itself. You just need to know how to form the rational equation um, from the graph given, how to, how to identify which is the correct graph based on the rational equation that they gave and or depending on how many questions they give you on rational functions. Um, what are the characteristics of the given rational function? based on the function or the graph, right? Now, identifying the graph also uses the same stats as forming the equation, but just that you already have the equation and you're just eliminating the graphs that don't fit the characteristics of the equation. All right, um, I know that was a lot. If you have any questions, bring it to your deep dive lesson or shoot me a message. Now, this one is to identify the characteristics. It's really, really handy. So first thing I'm going to do before even answering the questions is I'm going to um, simplify, I'm going to factor my equation here so that I can see which parts are the holes, which parts are the um, vertical asymptote, which is my x-intercepts, all right? So I've gone ahead and factored it for you, and it's going to give me x plus 3 and x minus 2 for the top. And for the bottom, I'm going to get negative 4 times x plus 3 times x plus 1. Now, if we look here, ooh, x plus 3 cancels out each other, which means that is my whole. Now, yes, uh, that's why you want to factor it out, because the term, the factors that cancel out will be your wholes, right? So these two cancel out each other, which means these are our wholes. The term on... Um, yeah, as I was saying, these two will be our holes because they cancel out each other. This will be our x-intercept because it's on top, and this will be our vertical asymptote because it's at the bottom. All right, and then b, our b will be negative one fourth. Mm -hmm. All righty, so now let's look. What is the coordinate of the whole of holes? So we just determined that our whole is going to be x plus three. All right, so let's write that down. So x plus 3 equals 0. I want to know the coordinate, so I need this in terms of x, which is going to give me x is negative 3, right? Now to find the coordinate of the whole, what I would need to do is um, find y now, right? Now when I'm finding y, I do not want to include this in the equation because if I do, I'm just going to get 0 and 0, which would be inconclusive. So I'm going to ignore these two parts. All right, and so I'm going to use y equals x minus 2 divided by negative 4x plus 1. Yes, as you can see, I'm going to use the parts that were not cancelled out in order to find the y-coordinate of my whole. All right, now I'm going to plug in negative 3 into where x is. So the top is going to give me negative 3 minus 2 
divide it by negative 4 times negative 3 plus 1. Okay? And from there, this is going to give me y equals negative 5 over 8. Therefore, my, the, cord, uh, the coordinates of my whole is going to be negative 3, negative 5 over 8. All right? Now, on to the next thing. We are going to find the x and y intercepts of the function. Now, again, if we look at the function, all right, I know my x-intercept is going to be the factor on top that wasn't canceled. So in this case, it's going to be x minus 2. So to find the coordinates, I'm going to do x minus 2 equals 0, x equals 2. That means my x-intercept is going to be 2, 0, right? Because all x-intercepts have a y-coordinate of 0. Now I'm going to find my... Now I'm going to find my y-intercept, which, um, because I know that all y-intercepts will have an x value, x coordinate of 0. So I'm going to plug in 0 into where x, it, where x is, right? So f of 0 is going to be, and I'm going to use the whole function, not the parts that just crossed out. I'm going to use the whole function this time, right? So I'm going to have... 0 squared plus 0 minus 6 divided by negative 4 times 0 squared minus 16 times 0 minus 12. That's going to give me negative 6 over negative 12, which is then going to be half. All right. So that means the coordinates of my y-intercept is going to be 0 half. All right. Now, for my vertical asymptote, I know my vertical asymptote is going to be the factor that is at the bottom of the fraction, so x plus 1, right? So to find my vertical asymptote, I'm going to do x plus 1 equals 0, isolate x to give us x equals negative 1, and that will be our vertical asymptote, all right? We're almost done, guys. Now, with horizontal asymptote, let's take a look. Ooh, look, their power functions, x squared, negative 4x squared. They both have the same degree, so it's going to be case 2, all right? So I'm going to take the coefficients of my top and bottom, which are, if I write, the top was x squared over negative 4x squared coefficient of, let's see, coefficient of 1 here and coefficient of negative 4. So that's going to give me 1 over negative 4. Therefore, my horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals negative 1 over 4. All right. Now, because I have a horizontal asymptote, that means I know straight away I do not have an oblique asymptote. It does not exist now, with horizontal oblique asymptotes, you can have one or the other, but you cannot have both. So you can either have a horizontal asymptote and no oblique asymptote, or you can have no horizontal asymptote or no uh, and an oblique asymptote. You cannot have both at the same time. And as you know, there are also some cases where you don't even have a horizontal asymptote or an oblique asymptote. Okay? Now, for your domain and range, I'm just going to write out some things first. Um, and here's why. For our whole, it was negative 3, negative 5 over 8. Our vertical asymptote was x equals negative 1. And our horizontal asymptote is y equals negative 1, 4. All right. Now, here's the reason why. For our domain, we're going to have to consider the whole and the vertical asymptote, because these are the parts where the graph cannot enter. All right, so we start from negative infinity, because there's nothing restricting it from negative infinity, to negative 3, because that's the first point it hits, union, negative 3, then the next one is going to be negative 1, union, 
negative 1 to infinity. All right. Now, the reason why you have negative 3 and negative 1 here is because at a whole, again, you count, it's a point in the graph that it, the line just doesn't touch us, right? It's a hole, it falls in. So that's why you have to consider negative 3. And again, the definition of vertical asymptote is that the line, the graph approaches the asymptote, but it never touches it, right? Which is why you would consider this also. And so the domain is going to be negative infinity to negative 3, union, negative 3 to negative 1, union, negative 1 to infinity. All right. Now with range, it's the same thing. This time, though, we would need to consider the whole and the horizontal asymptote for the very same reason for uh, we consider the whole and the vertical asymptote for the domain. All right. So with range, we start with negative infinity to negative 5 over 8, all right, because negative 5 over 8 is smaller than negative 1 over 4. Union negative 5 over 8 until 1 over 4. Union negative 1 over 4 to positive infinity, all right. Again, it's because these two parts, the graph approaches but never actually touches it. That's why you have to consider the whole and the horizontal asymptote for your range. I know that was a lot. We have been through a lot. Um, if you have any questions about all of this, bring it to your deep dive lesson. All right, on to our very last question for today. Thank you for hanging in there, guys. All right, so the first thing I want to do for when I'm solving rational equations is if I have a polynomial like at this bottom here, I want to factor it. So I'm going to write the parts that I didn't touch yet. And then I'm going to factor the polynomial for you. And so that's going to give me, let's see, 1, 6, 5. So I will get these for factor form, so I'm going to do this. Now, as you can see, the reason I do that is because we need to make these, well, we needed to determine what it, the common denominator would be, right? Now, if I had not done this, I might have multiplied all these with everything. Now, because if I look, I either have x plus 2 or x plus 3 on the other fractions, right? This fraction has it all, which means this is the common denominator. This tells me that for this fraction, I need to multiply the top and the bottom with x plus 3. And this fraction, I need to multiply the top and the bottom with x plus 2. And this fraction, I don't need to do anything because it has the common denominator. All right. So we look at our setup. It's going to look like this. And now I'm going to distribute everything as necessary to give me x squared plus 3x over, again, I'm just going to leave this um, in factor form. Now from here, um, two things I'm going to do. I'm going to put all of these into one big fraction since they have a common denominator now. And I'm going to bring this over here by subtracting both sides with 5x. Uh, I'm going to subtract both sides with 5x plus 10 over x plus 2, x plus 3. All right. So how that's going to look like is this. We have x squared plus 3x plus 2 over x plus 2, x plus 3, minus 5x plus 10 over x plus 2, x plus 3 equals 0. 
All right. Now I'm going to put these because they have the common denominator. I'm going to put the top all into one big fraction. And so that is going to give me x squared plus 3x plus 2 minus, let's put parentheses because it's a minus sign. It will affect the signs for these, right? Um, 5x plus 10 over x plus 2, x plus 3 equals 0. From here, I'm going to distribute the parentheses of the negative sign to give me x squared plus 3x plus 2 minus 5x minus 10 over x plus 2 x plus 3 equals 0 group the like terms x squared minus 2x minus 8 over all that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to factor my top and see what it will give me, right? Because I might be able to simplify. Let's draw a line so we have space. I'll do the rest on top there. So once I factor it out, which I already did for you, I am going to get x minus 4 times x plus 2 over x over x plus 2 times x plus 3 equals 0. Oh look, x plus 2 and x plus 2, which means these two can cancel out each other, which gives me x minus 4 over x plus 3 equals 0. Now, in order to find my solution, I'm just going to honestly uh, multiply both sides by x plus 3 because I want to get rid of the fraction, right? So x plus 3, x plus 3, which will then give me x minus 4 equals 0. Solve for x, x equals 4. So this would be my solution. All right. Now, but if you actually look in the instruction, we have something what we call also to list any extraneous solution. So an, an, so an extraneous solution would be a value of x where, you know, the equation can equal to. But if you were to put it in, it would make your equation be undefined. Right. And so in order to find the um, in order to find the extraneous solution, you're actually going to take the bottom of the fraction that you have to find it, right? Because if anything makes this zero, then your equation would be undefined, all right? So to find the extraneous solution, we are gonna do x plus three equals zero, isolate x to give us x equals negative three, which then tells us that x cannot be negative three for this is the extraneous solution. All right, and that's how you solve rational equations. I know that is a lot, but thank you for tuning in this past hour, guys. Good job paying attention and taking down the notes that you need. All right, and again, as usual, if you have any questions, bring it to your deep dive lessons or shoot me a message. All right, good job today, y'all, on rational expressions and equations. Have a good rest of your day.